What is up? Good mic work back at you finally with what will probably be a relatively brief commentary. I apologize for the delay in my SmackDown review this week. I told you in my last commentary that my week has been very busy and my personal life has been a little bit nuts now, especially at work. My partner, the person that I share my responsibilities with, has been in Indonesia for the past 10 days and I've been, you know, basically doing everything myself. So I'm waiting for her to get back and work has been nuts. And that is why it affected my SummerSlam weekend and why I was not able to come up here and review NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. I wasn't even home to see the show. So I knew the rest of the week was going to be funny as well. Here it is very, very late Wednesday night, early on Thursday, and I'm finally getting up here with a few thoughts on SmackDown, a couple of other things that you guys have been demanding that I talk about. On social media, you guys have been like, where's your commentary? Where's your commentary? And I appreciate that. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate everybody being so anxious to hear my thoughts on a certain subject. But at the same time, I have this thing called a life, and sometimes it gets busy and it affects how I do commentaries. It's very rare that things are a little bit delayed, and I do apologize for that. But I'm finally up here now. I just want to reiterate my programming note that I let you guys know about in my last commentary. Not only am I going through a very busy couple of weeks right now, it's going to get busier. I'm about to relocate and move, and I did mention to you guys that September is going to be a little bit funny and a little bit inconsistent content-wise on the channel. You will be getting a QA and a in a couple of weeks. You will also be getting a DVD review in the next two or three weeks as well. But as far as my Raw and SmackDown reviews, I don't know when they're going to occur right now throughout the month of September. And then when October hits, everything should be back to normal. And I've been thinking about, starting in October, going to the format of doing one long podcast per week discussing both shows, most likely on Wednesdays. That might, in the long run, give me more time to work on other stuff like top tens, DVD reviews, this day in histories, Q&As, shit like that. So I'm going to be spending that crazy month of September kind of thinking of different ideas, and by the time we get to October, I should have a pretty good idea of what I want to do. So anyway, sorry to bore you with those details. It's just something I feel like I need to mention in my next couple of commentaries. couple milestones on the channel this week as well. I just realized that I surpassed 13,000 subs now on the YouTube channel. So that's awesome. Thank you to everyone and welcome to all the newer listeners that have come aboard. Uh, Recently passed uh, 3,000 Twitter followers as well, and my website is now a year old. I started it, I think, on uh, August 23rd of last year. So the website's been up and running now for a year. It's got pretty good traffic on it, according to my analytics. If any of you don't know about it or have never checked it out, the link is in the description below. It's nothing special, but it does have my YouTube videos over there, downloadable versions of my podcast, and links to all my radio sites, and you can buy merchandise, you can donate, do all sorts of stuff over there. So check out goodmicworkcommentaries.com if you have not yet already. Are you finally ready to hear me talk about SmackDown? Shut the fuck up, Good Mic Work, and get into what we want to hear. Okay, fine, let's talk about SmackDown. Where should we begin? There's a lot to talk about. Everybody wants my opinion on The Miz, and I will get to that. But first, let's discuss SmackDown. I'm just going to gloss over the show here. We're going to go through it pretty quick, but the show does open up with a backstage segment. All the boys are in the locker room, and AJ Styles comes strutting in there, bragging about what he did to John Cena. He's talking shit to everybody, and Dolph Ziggler is kind of sitting there with his head down, and he gets right in Dolph's face. Dolph winds up punching him after a little bit of shit talking, and the two have to be separated. We then go to the ring, where Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon make their entrance, and in the ring are a bunch of the SmackDown stars and a bunch of new championship belts. Tag team titles have been created for SmackDown, and a new women's title have been created for SmackDown. And big, huge fucking surprise, they are just carbon copies of the belts that already exist. Now, we all know how I feel and a lot of people feel about the Universal title. We are furious that the WWE is so lazy and uncreative, and it just sucks that everything has to fucking look the same. So I don't think many of us were shocked to see what they did here with the belts. Uh, A lot of people did not complain about these nearly as bad as they complain about the Universal title. A lot of people feel that the blue looks very good. The new SmackDown women's title looks exactly like the one that Charlotte carries, except it's blue instead of red. And then the tag team titles look exactly like the Raw tag team titles, except they are more silver. They just look the same, and, you know, it's just something that we have to accept. You know, title belts looking ugly is nothing new. I think a lot of fans just... You know, overreacted. I was one of them really freaked out about the Universal title because we just can't believe that they have to do it this way and everything has to fucking look the same. But when you, at the end of the day, are you really surprised? It's what the WWE does. 
So I'm not going to freak out about it. The look of the title at the end of the day is not something that I'm really going to lose sleep over. It's, it's just annoying as a wrestling fan, especially an old school wrestling fan. What I envision a championship belt should look like really is what none of the WWE titles currently look like with the exception of uh, the U.S. and Intercontinental belt. So these belts have to be awarded to people, right? Now, Daniel Bryan and uh, Shane McMahon had the women's division and the, and the tag team division completely in the ring during this whole presentation. And they announced that the women would be facing off at Backlash, which is just in a couple of weeks on September 11th, I believe. They're going to be in a six-pack challenge. So they're going to put all the girls in one match. The winner just wins the belt outright. With the tag team belts, they're going to do a tournament with the finals culminating at Backlash. So that tournament will be taking place in the next couple of weeks on SmackDown. Just as Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon are wrapping up these announcements, Heath Slater comes through the crowd with a microphone. He's pissed off. I'll tell you what, this guy is fucking over. Is he not? Am I crazy? I've never really liked Heath Slater that much. Never liked his look, especially in the beginning with that weird-ass hair that he had and everything. But now he's he's really come into his own, and he's fucking great on the mic. So I can see big things for Heath Slater, provided the WWE does not turn him into Santino Morella or something like that, which they're kind of already doing, but I think it's something that could build and lead to something more. He's not going to be a laughing stock or a comedy bit on the roster for very long if the fans keep cheering for him the way they are. We we should hope anyway. The creative team might have their heart, heart set on a direction they want for him and he's meant for nothing more than comedy and looking stupid, but hopefully, you know, they realize the fans reaction to this guy and give him some opportunities. You know, eventually he's going to land a contract somewhere. So, Shane McMahon and Daniel Bryan give him yet another chance. They say if you can find somebody to be your tag team partner and you can enter this tournament and actually win it and become tag team champions, that's the only way you're going to get a SmackDown contract. So Heath was going to be on a mission to find a partner throughout SmackDown. AJ Styles comes out there as well to start cutting a promo and bragging about what he did to John Cena. And before he gets too many words out, Dolph attacks him from behind and they start brawling in the aisle way. Later on, AJ would come out to cut a promo talking about his destruction of John Cena. You know, John Cena took off his armband after the match at SummerSlam and kind of laid it in the ring. And AJ was putting it on as a headband in the uh, opening segment. Then he was wearing it on his arm during the promo, which I really liked. Dolph Ziggler winds up coming out there again. And Daniel Bryan interrupts before things get too out of hand and says, knock it off, knock it off. You guys want to fight. It's obvious. Daniel Bryan, actually, during this segment, cut a really good promo. He was screaming. He was yelling. He was believable. I loved it. And he tells the two guys, and you could smell it coming a mile away, right from the very opening segment. You're like, holy shit, Dolph Ziggler and AJ are probably going to battle for a shot at the title. And what have I been saying in the past couple of commentaries Leading up to SummerSlam, I was saying that part of the reason why I was changing my mind on my SummerSlam prediction is because I think AJ would be a perfect guy to put the belt on sometime in the future. And I was expecting him to get a title run or a title feud this fall, but I wasn't expecting him to get it right away. So Daniel Bryan makes the number one contenders match for the main event between Dolph Ziggler and AJ Styles in a fantastic match. This entire show was actually very good. I enjoyed it. Dean Ambrose was on commentary for the whole thing. It had great near falls, great action. Dolph and AJ, when you talk about in-ring guys, you don't find too many better than them. And they put on a hell of a show, and the finish saw AJ Styles beating Dolph Ziggler and becoming the new number one contender, and he's going to take on Dean Ambrose at Backlash for the title, and the two of them had a stare down to close the show. Now, I like this. I'm so glad AJ is getting a title shot. I want to see him chase it a little bit, though. I mean, this pay-per-view is, like, right around the corner. It's so close. September 11th is not that far away at all. I don't... I'm not ready to see AJ win the belt yet. I like Dean Ambrose's run. I think he's doing a good job with it. I thought he was going to have another match or two with Dolph Ziggler before he moved on to AJ Styles, but they're doing this right away. So I'm all for AJ winning the belt, and I kind of hope that he does, but I don't know if I want to see it in two weeks. I would almost like to see Dean Ambrose escape, beat AJ Styles somehow, AJ gets a rematch at No Mercy or whatever the fuck, and then wins the title there or wins the title Survivor Series, something like that. I just wanted to see Dean's run last a little longer. So even though I'm thrilled AJ Styles is getting the title shot, I almost wish they would have waited and gone with a rematch or something at Backlash because this is kind of one of those... 
I don't know, it's not like it's SummerSlam. It's one of those, I don't want to say throwaway pay-per-views, but now that you have two pay-per-views a month from both brands, it's just a little nuts. So I don't think that Backlash is necessarily the time to put the belt on AJ, but I could be completely wrong. I just got done saying also in my previous commentaries that WWE needs to strike while the iron's hot with AJ, and he's over now, he's getting big victories, he's healthy, This is the time to utilize him to his fullest potential before he, number one, gets too old or number two, gets injured, which, of course, we've seen injuries are playing a big role in WWE right now. So they might not want to wait any longer with AJ and put the belt on him now. But as far as I'm concerned, they can wait a little bit. Maybe Dean wins the first encounter and then AJ wins the next one. And then after that, they can do one more as the blow off in a cage or something or other at Survivor Series or TLC possibly is another option. And AJ can finish up business with Dean Ambrose and go on into the new year as champion. That's what I think they're going to do on SmackDown. And I'm not completely convinced either that we have seen our last AJ Styles-John Cena match either. The other major angle and storyline was Randy Orton actually cut a promo. I was surprised to see him on SmackDown. I think he should have taken a week off, but he came out there sporting those 12 staples in his fucking head. He was dressed a little more hardcore. His outfit reminded me of what... uh, Edge war in his hardcore match with Mick Foley at WrestleMania 22. Kind of had like the cut off sleeveless hoodie type of thing or whatever. And uh, he cut a promo, basically said that he wasn't sure how he felt about Shane McMahon getting in the ring and doing what he did. He doesn't think the match should have been stopped the way it was. And he vowed that Brock Lesnar has not seen the last of him, which I echoed after SummerSlam. I'm like, how can you think that this could possibly be the end of Randy Orton and Brock Lesnar? Whether or not they have a one-on-one match in the future again sometime or not, I don't know. All I know is Brock Lesnar has not seen his last RKO. He will eat another one. That's almost guaranteed. And Randy Orton is then interrupted by what looks to be his next feud, Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt comes out, and he's kind of on his own now because he kicked Eric Rowan to the curb, I think, last week or the week before. And comes out there in a little bit more of a new look. He had the hood on, and he sat in the rocking chair, cut a great promo on Randy Orton, and says he's going to find out why Bray Wyatt is a god and gods can't be killed. And, you know, typical Bray Wyatt promo, very good. I liked it a little more with him being in the hood and it being a little darker. And I think the two of these guys can have a great feud together. And then Bray Wyatt kind of disappears, and that's the end of that segment. So Randy Orton should be taking on Bray Wyatt, uh, most likely at Backlash or the pay-per-view after. They then cut to a backstage segment immediately after, talking to Shane McMahon and asking him about Brock Lesnar. Shane McMahon, of course, ate an F5 at SummerSlam. Uh, They even did the thing, which I got a chuckle out of, Stephanie McMahon. You know, she said on Raw that Brock would pay for what he did and there would be repercussions. So she announced that they are fining Brock Lesnar $500 for his attack on Shane McMahon. And I couldn't help but laugh about that. But what I find concerning is that it actually seems like they are going to build towards a Shane McMahon and Brock Lesnar match. And I don't know if I want to see that. How in the world can they make this match believable? How in the world can they build this match to where you think Shane McMahon has any chance at all in winning this thing? He hasn't come out of the winning end on many feuds that he's been in with major stars. And if you want people to think that Brock could actually lose a match, plus Brock's time is so valuable, so limited, and you can use this monster that you have to put over somebody in the future, why are you going to waste a date on him battling Shane McMahon? Shane doesn't stand a chance. It might be a fun match, don't get me wrong. You know, Brock can suplex Shane off the top of the goddamn arena. That could be great stuff. Suplex City off of a bridge into a river below or something like that. You know, I have no doubt that Shane will Peter Pan off of something, but I don't see what the point of that match is unless they do a handicap type of deal. Triple H has not been seen in a very long time. He could make another appearance here if they start... You know, if Brock starts fucking with the McMahon family, maybe they all rise up to take Brock out. Or maybe Shane McMahon formulates a team to take on Brock and a bunch of guys at Survivor Series. I don't know what the hell they're going to do. All I know is if this thing ends with a one-on-one match with Shane and Brock Lesnar, I don't see the point in doing that because there's no way Shane McMahon can win unless a major person interferes in this thing and uh, sets up another match. So I I don't know where they're going with this, but the idea initially of a Shane Brock match I am not crazy about. 
Now, just to briefly mention a couple of the other matches on SmackDown real quick, the tag team tournament was underway. Uh, Heath Slater, like I said, had to go around and find a partner. He approached The Miz. He approached Arn Anderson. Finally, lands Rhino as his partner. Rhino was the guy that laid him out a few weeks ago when he was trying to get a contract, so the two of them are going to team up. I don't believe they have a match on this SmackDown. I think they're going to have one next week. But we saw the Usos get a victory over the Ascension. And I believe we saw American Alpha beat Brizango. So next week they'll do a couple more matches. I mean, there's only like six teams or something. Or maybe seven. Maybe eight. I don't know. There's not many teams on SmackDown. So it's not like this tournament is going to take forever. So I would assume that we would probably... I haven't seen the brackets, but I would assume that we would probably see... I don't know, the Usos and American Alpha maybe in the finals. Maybe that could be a good swerve and could be a way to turn the Usos heel and have them turn heel and win the belts and not give American Alpha the belts right away like WWE seems like they're very into doing right now with NXT talent, bringing them right up and giving them matches. Look what happened with uh, Finn Balor. He won the Universal title. Bailey is going to be getting a women's title shot, and then you give American Alpha the belts right out of the gate. Uh, You know, I'm not complaining. These are all very capable and deserving workers. But Jesus, do you have to go so fucking fast? The girls had a couple of matches. Becky tapped out Alexa Bliss. And Nikki is back to take on Carmella, although she gets attacked and the match never got underway. And she got beat up by Carmella. So Carmella, I'm coming for you. Or on you. Take your pick. So that pretty much does it for SmackDown. I might be missing something here or there, but uh, those were basically the important moments of SmackDown. Now into what everybody wants to hear me talk about, and that is what the hell got into The Miz on the Talking Smack show. Now they got this, is it called Smack Talk or is it called Talking Smack? I forget, but anyway, it airs right after SmackDown on the WWE Network. Renee Young hosts it. She brings in a bunch of people, usually talks to the GMs and brings in a couple of stars. So Daniel Bryan's there talking. The Miz comes in, and he's mad about not being involved in that big opening ceremony and uh, how the Intercontinental title is important. It's the only belt right now in the WWE that I like the physical look of. And he's pissing and moaning, and Daniel Bryan kind of says something like, you know, you wrestle like a coward or whatever, and The Miz just fucking goes off. And one of the greatest promos, one of the most believable promos to ever come out of the Miz's mouth. He got right in Daniel Bryan's face, and I immediately got rock hard. I was like, wow. I have never seen the Miz like this. This was such a brilliant, uh, I guess it would be a work shoot. There's no way this was a shoot. There's no way the Miz would say those things to Daniel Bryan. But what it could have been is kind of uh, a work shoot similar to what CM Punk did. But am I the only one that was wondering if that could lead to a Daniel Bryan in-ring return? I didn't think that was possible. WWE doesn't want him to wrestle again. But how can you have an angle like that? How can you have somebody get in Daniel Bryan's face like that without Daniel Bryan getting in the ring to kick his fucking ass? Now, it could be a great way to get The Miz over. It fucking worked. Everybody is talking about The Miz. Some people out there who were the biggest Miz critics are now on his bandwagon. I'm actually one of them. There was a time there where... I'd rather watch Mantar versus Ralphus in a bikini pillow fight than fucking see The Miz on TV. And here he is on this random-ass interview on the WWE Network after SmackDown is off the air, cutting one of the greatest promos I've ever heard. I mean, this should have been on the main show. That would have been great. But watching this, I'm like, okay, if it's a way to get some heat on The Miz, it worked. He is definitely absolutely gold on the mic, but he really already has been for quite some time. This just really put it over the top. But for him to get in Daniel Bryan's face like that, and I know this is so far-fetched, there's probably no way in the world he can get back in the ring, but shit, after that promo, how can you at least not think that that could be a possibility. Daniel Bryan leaves the set. He storms off. Even Renee Young chimed in perfectly like, whoa, whoa, settle down, calm down. I mean, everything was really perfectly done and it struck enough doubt in your mind to where even the smartest wrestling fan wondered, even for a split second, they still wondered if it was a legitimate shoot because that's the way it came off. And when you can accomplish that, you are considered a great worker especially on the mic and the Miz he deserves credit in my book I mean he was shit on for so long he wasn't taken seriously he was a goddamn real world MTV reality star Chris Benoit threw him out of the locker room for like six months at one time he does not have the respect of the boys I've felt 
years ago. I've seen people bury him in shoot interviews. So the fact that he's been able to work through all that, persevere, and become one of the most entertaining people on the roster, big props to The Miz for pulling that off. And I'm excited to see where this leads. You know, like I said, if Daniel Bryan's not going to get back in the ring, I guess this just makes Miz even bigger of an asshole than he already was. And it's nice to see that he can be so funny and so full of himself and so arrogant and egotistical, but he can also be mean and nasty and have that killer instinct at the same time. And he's poised to become a star. He still loses a lot of matches and shit, but with a promo like that, how can you not think that maybe one day that WWE title could be coming back to him? He had that fluke run in 2011. We never thought he would even be in the same room with that title ever again. And if he keeps cutting promos like that and keeps the fans talking, you know, that title could definitely be in his future once again. So way to go, Miz. So that is it. I am out of here. It's been a very long week. I got to get some rest and chill out. I will be up here probably next week. It's going to be, it might be a joint show because I'm going to be moving and relocating and it's just a, a regular build, both Raw and SmackDown are building towards their next pay-per-views, and neither show should be catastrophic. I doubt any major things will happen on that show, so I will probably wait until, like, Wednesday and come up here and review both shows. That's probably what you're going to get out of me. I'm also behind on the Cruiserweight Classic. I'm sorry for not mentioning anything about that tonight or NXT. Because of my busy week, I have not been able to check either one of those shows out either, but I probably will tomorrow. Curious to see what happened on NXT and how that belt looked on new champion Shinsuke Nakamura. So leave me all your comments below, anything you have to say about Raw, SmackDown, SummerSlam, Backlash, whatever. Let me know about it, and I will talk to you in just a few days. Until then, peace.